Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, so I'm very happy to see a large audience to this, which is the fourth uh, colloquio of the uh, class of the Scuola of 2018. Um, um, sorry, the introduction of the speaker and uh, of the topic will be made by um, my colleague, uh, Professor Catania, in a second. Um, so thanks for coming. And the next uh, colloquium will be in a month from now, so around the 23rd of uh, May. Uh, it will be a topic which is somehow connected by the word information, but uh, disconnected by the other word quantum. Uh, and uh, uh, so it should be on the 23rd of May. And uh, now uh, I'm happy to uh, let uh, Antonino introduce the speaker. So thanks for coming. So welcome to everyone. It's a pleasure to host our guest of today, Marcello Massimini. Marcello Massimini is, uh, is full professor of physiology at the, uni at the University of uh, Statale di Milano. Uh, Marcello is a medical doctor. He graduated in 1996 in, uh, in medicine at, in, at the University of Milano. He had, he had his PhD in human physiology uh, uh, also at the University of Milano. And then he spent uh, quite a few years uh, abroad. First he went to, uh, he spent some time in uh, uh, Canada at the University of Quebec. And then uh, he spent uh, three or four years at, uh, uh, as a research associate at the University of Wisconsin. And Marcello, working with Giulio Tononi. And Marcello was telling me earlier that he uh, agreed to, and he went to, to work with Tononi uh, when Tononi was at uh, University of California, San Diego. And he was looking forward to going uh, to San Diego, actually. So besides the excitement of, of working with Tononi on the, on the problem of consciousness, he was also excited to go to California. And when he uh, had to buy his ticket, Tononi rang him up and said, well, actually, you should go to Madison, Wisconsin, which was not the most of his... Uh... Anyway, this was a very fruitful period for Marcel, and then he, he came back to Italy, and he, uh, where he is now. So the theme of uh, Mar uh, Marcello's uh, uh, research is consciousness. And uh, as you can understand, uh, the understanding the neural basis of consciousness or the basis of consciousness, if I may say, because uh, you never know the right words to use in this theme, is a central theme in, in, uh, in uh, neurosciences today, not only in neurosciences. And a philosophical theme uh, a few years back uh, it has become, uh, in, uh, in the past uh, two decades, uh, a theme where some brave and, and, uh, and, uh, and courageous uh, neuroscientists have, have started uh, uh, working on, on, the, on, the, on the neural basis of this phenomenon. And as you can understand, uh, this is a, is a crucial theme, and uh, uh, Marcello has made some uh, uh, fundamental contributions to this uh, topic. As you can understand, uh, this is not only of relevance for uh, neurosciences as, and for understanding the brain, but the results that are coming from this research have also broader implications in terms of ethics, jurisdiction, and uh, uh, in the very nature of, uh, of, uh, of our inner self. So we thank uh, Marcello for coming, and we look forward to your talk, and thank you very much again. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you very much, Antonino, and everybody for inviting me here. I'm very honored, actually, to be in this fantastic place. And uh, yeah, I, I agree. I, I wouldn't say neural correlates. I would say the physical substrate of consciousness to, in order to be more general. And actually, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, you know, describe an effort, whether this is successful or not, we will see in, you know, in the future. But at least it's a serious effort to try to measure something in the physical world out there that lets us infer about the presence of consciousness outside of ourselves. We know we are conscious. I know I'm conscious right now. I cannot doubt about it. But when it comes to deciding whether um, another person or maybe another being or maybe a machine is conscious, then it becomes complicated. You need measures. And this is the kind of adventure we try to you know, uh, dive into. Um, and actually, it's always difficult to start uh, uh, a lecture on consciousness because you don't know where to start from. There's a philosophical perspective. There are so many ways of introducing the problem. And I would like to start with a very general, you know, point about measuring. So this is my first introduction to the problem. That is, 
this graph that I'm borrowing actually from Christoph Koch and Giulio Tononi, I think it's a very interesting graph because it says basically how do we normally uh, assess consciousness in the world around us? Take animals, you know, the biological world. Well, normally what we do, but we do this also in patients, is we take intelligence, function, input-output relationships, and we take this as a proxy for the capacity for experience, that is consciousness. So basically, I might... You know, we normally say, well, a monkey behaves in a way that is complex. Input-output relationships are complex. Behavior function is complex. And thus, it is more conscious probably than a jellyfish. We don't have any problem in, you know, just, you know, killing a jellyfish. We have more problems with the monkey because we assume that the monkey is suffering more. And then this, along a scale, we assume, we assume this sort of relationship, direct relationship. Whether it's linear or not, it doesn't, I mean, it's, you know, but in general, this is the case. But this is not so, I mean, it's not watertight. Uh, think about octopi, uh, think about parrots talking. Man, when we go away from mammals, it becomes very complicated. But actually, the point I want to make, which is a little bit extreme, is that this is completely wrong. It can be completely wrong and very misleading. So this is the graph I was talking about. We have on the x-axis, we have intelligence, behavior, input-output, function, and we infer experience, consciousness, from behavior. Okay, so why is it, why can this be so misleading? I'll give you an example, and especially this can be misleading and it has ethical consequences for the future. One, we are saving patients that only 50 years ago would have died. Patients surviving from coma, I will talk about this later, and these are patients that sometimes are completely disconnected from the outside world. Brain islands, one hemisphere, half hemisphere. We don't know, the back, the back of the brain. And, uh, but they might be completely disconnected. There is no behavior, no function, no input-output in these cases. But there might be consciousness. This is a clear dissociation. On the other end of the spectrum, as you know, we are also uh, you know, pushing, and especially in these years, uh, very much on uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning. You know, you know what's happening right now. So this is Watson from IBM, it can answer any question, uh, can win uh, Jeopardy in the US, you know, the, the um, TV show where you, get, you got questions and everything, it was able to, you know, beat humans. And uh, so this is function in terms of input output, it's a powerful machine. And it's, you know, behaving much better than any patient with brain injury. But is this conscious or not? It might score very low on the consciousness axis, but if we judge from function, intelligent behavior, then we can be misled, especially in the future when this machine might be connected to um, anthropomorphic uh, robots. It might happen. I mean, uh, it's, it's just a matter of time. It will happen. So if this passed the Turing test, then we don't know. I mean, we can really, you know, have problems because we can deny consciousness to systems who are conscious and attribute consciousness to systems that are unconscious. So I think that this is the first point and it's a key thing that says, well, we need to find alternative ways that are independent on function, intelligence and behavior to measure consciousness directly into physical systems. Then there is another way to introduce the problem and this was the way it was introduced to me uh, personally, that is the existential sort of consciousness way, but it's the same thing. It boils down to the same problem. And the way is, my case, for instance, medical school, fourth year, I was attending my first autopsy. You get to you know, examine different organs, the liver, the spleen, then you get the heart, interesting organs, very, you know, and then, then it comes to the brain and you're holding this you know, tofu-like jelly matter with borders, with a weight, and then you stop for a moment and you think that a universe, just like yours, dreams, everything, colors, memories, emotions, sadness, joy, was in that thing. That's crazy. I mean, it is really a mind-shattering experience if you think about it. You are holding an object with borders, an object that is nothing special, and in that object there was everything. And I think it's pretty much, uh, you know, the same of a sublime, mind-shattering experience that were experienced by the astronaut of the Apollo missions who, you know, they turned their head and, you saw, and they saw the, you know, our planet like a tiny blue dot, you know, lost in space. It's, I mean, it's, things are, are, are not the same after that. I mean, everything changes in your perspective. It's crazy. And, um, and you ask, when you find yourself in that spot, uh, you're not, you know, wondering how 
does the brain you know, generate the flames of self-reflection and uh, regrets and all these complex things? That doesn't matter really. Not even, you don't even ask, you know, how, how can I perceive, how can the brain perceive complex scenes like this you know, painting or this uh, beautiful room? No, you don't ask that. You're simply asking and you're simply wondering how is it possible that a piece of matter like this can host a subject who sees pure light pure darkness, it doesn't matter how complex it is, you know, what's being perceived, there is somebody there seeing dark. This is the mystery. What is it special about this object that you can hold in your hand that is, you know, one kilo uh, and 400 grams, if so, and, uh, and it's just like that. I mean, it's nothing really special if you hold it. So you ask, physically speaking, what's special in here? And this is the question, actually. Is there any special ingredient? Is it something that you know, makes this object so special? Many philosophers, um, not all of them, but you know, many, and uh, also scientists would say, well, yeah, neuroscience is good, many things. Uh, we have explained so many things. But now, you know, when it comes to experience, consciousness, you better stop. Uh, there is a, you know, a heart problem, uh, we won't be able to solve it. So this is a nice, very nice sentence from Colin McGinn. We will never know how the water of the physical brain is turned into the wine of consciousness. There are many other you know, um, nice ways to say the same thing. We'll never know. We will not be able to connect the physical world to the um, world of experience. And, uh, and this is a position that you, know, you can hold. And you can also consider this position very humble and a sort of, uh, you know, for once, scientists are holding back and say, well, I cannot go there. So it's, it, it sounds good in a way, but in another way, it's not so good if you think about it. Because, because if you take and maintain this position, then you also need to be aware of what are the consequences of this. And one of the consequences is that if you, you know, uh, give up on understanding the mechanism of consciousness, you also put yourself in the position of not seeing consciousness in other people, starting from human beings. And this is ethically something that maybe we cannot afford. So now comes the clinical introduction to the problem. So there was the ethical measuring consciousness in the world, there is the existential question that we all have, more or less, and then there is the clinical issue, and this is the most urgent issue. So this is a patient in a coma. Coma is a state similar to sleep, eyes closed, quiescence, uh, the patient is not responding to stimuli, but it's different from sleep because you cannot even wake up the patient for strong, painful stimuli. This is the thing, this is coma. Coma is not a permanent state. Normally it lasts for two weeks, three weeks maybe, maximum. So when you read on a newspaper, uh, emerges from coma after three years, it's wrong. It's always wrong. So coma, either you die, or sooner or later, the patient opened his eyes, okay? Uh, 50, 50 years ago, coma was the way to death, normally. Now, with artificial respiration, intensive care medicine, you can survive through the difficult phase of coma, where the brain is swelling, pushing down on the brainstem, so the brainstem, which is an ancient part of the brain controlling respiration, suffers, and you stop breathing, and uh, basically, there is a cardiac, cardiorespiratory arrest. Now, this doesn't happen necessarily. You can hold the breath, you can, you know, do artificial ventilation, everything. So you, now, it is often the case that brain injury patients, even with, with severe brain injury, they survive coma. And then at some point, if they don't go to brain death, they open their eyes. Two weeks, three weeks, normally. That's, that's, that's what happens, normally. And, uh, Best case scenario is that the patient opens his eyes and talks, or maybe react to commands. Are you here? Squeeze my hand if you can hear me. Yeah, and the patient does this. No problem. Consciousness is there, you can see it. We don't doubt that the patient is conscious. We take it, you know, as I don't doubt of you know, anybody else conscious. If I ask, are you here? And you say, yes, I trust you. Um, worst case scenario, the patient opens his eyes. So wakefulness comes back by the point of view of a neurologist, we measure wakefulness by eyes opening. It's like a master switch. The system is on, eyes opening, but consciousness does not come back. These patients remain unresponsive. Whatever you do, they don't react to anything. They don't show any sign of purposeful activity. And actually, vegetative state is now an old definition. Now, these patients are called unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. 
which describes pretty well their state. They are awake, but they're completely unresponsive, and thus we assume they're unconscious. Vegetative state or unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. Then things are even more complicated because in 2002, another gray area was discovered that is the minimally conscious state. That's in between. So those are patients, they open their eyes, they react to commands every once in a while. Maybe they track people in the room. That's the only thing they do. Or maybe sometimes they, you know, they, they respond to command. But they do it today, they don't do it tomorrow. Fluctuating, very difficult to assess, very difficult to detect, but it's very important to detect them because these patients, they have a better prognosis if they undergo rehabilitation and they are conscious to some extent. We don't know of what. It can be a dreamlike experience. It can be uh, an intermediate state, like when we're falling asleep or being anesthetized at different levels, or it can be sort of an hallucination or maybe conscious wakefulness, but fully paralyzed, or almost fully paralyzed. We don't know. So it's clearly a big problem. We are saving many of these patients, 200,000 per year in the United States, there are patients like this, 300,000. It's like a city. And uh, the problem is, which is a big problem in clinical neurology, there is a big, large uh, diagnosis, mislabeling um, error. That is, 40% uh, of these patients are wrongly diagnosed and labeled as unconscious. And this is, of course, you know, an issue. So why do we make this mistake? Because we take the input-output approach for lack of better options. Because we don't know better, we consider the brain as a black box and we work on input and output. We do this every day in the emergency room, intensive care. What we do is actually we uh, stimulate the patient, we ask the patient to do things and then we observe motor behavior. If we see motor behavior, fine, no problem. If we don't see motor behavior, we normally say, well, patient is unconscious, unresponsive, unconscious. But is it the case? So the first point, important point, is that the absence of the proof, that is the absence of motor responses to sensory stimulation, is not the proof of the absence of consciousness. Take the trivial example of a patient who's completely paralyzed. I mean, he would understand everything, he would want to, move, to do and to react, but he can't. It's like a stone. How do you let people know that you are conscious if you're paralyzed? Anesthesiologists, they have this problem. Every once in a while, actually one out of a thousand, there is an anesthesia awareness. So the patient is anesthetized, paralyzed with drugs in order to avoid muscle, con muscle contraction and everything, and the patient regains consciousness, but he's fully paralyzed. He's artificially ventilated and completely paralyzed. And there's no way the patient can let the surgeon or the anesthesiologist know that he is conscious. It's not a good, I mean, it's, it, it can be a traumatic experience, like post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, but in patients, this, this can be a, a permanent condition. The anesthetized subject, after anesthesia awareness, he wakes up and he will be able to say, hey, look, I was there. I heard you talking about me. I was listening to the noise of the electronic, uh, you know, scalpel and everything, the smell of the surgery. Uh, but the patient, uh, so uh, classic example, locked in syndrome. Locked in syndrome is a trivial small lesion in the brainstem. Uh, so in the ventral pons is this part of the brain where the fibers going to, from the cortex to the spinal cord are running in a bundle, very thin. And uh, a small lesion is enough to cut all motor output. These patients are fully paralyzed, except for, sooner or later, they recover the um, ability, this is a thin channel, it's the third cranial nerves, which is above the lesion, which controls vertical eye movements and blinking, so they recover vertical eye movement and blinking. But nobody knows, I mean, actually, uh, back then, uh, in 10, 10 years ago, these patients were often misdiagnosed, and maybe, a relative was noticing that these movements were not random, you know? because vegetative state, patient, state patients are not, you know, are not just not moving. They have reflexive activity. They do a lot of things, but they're not reactive to stimuli. So it's very difficult to judge whether a movement is on purpose or it's just a random machinery uh, ra reflexes. So uh, sometimes the, 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 the relatives say, oh, no, but this is, I mean, can you hear me? If you hear me, do it twice, and the patient do, does it twice. And then, uh, are you here? Are you, is it true that your name is? And, the patient, and then you have communication. 
It's a binary communication. It's very simple, but it's communication. Some people and some, some patients were able to write beautiful books. I'm, I'm sure you know about uh, the diving bell, the butterfly and the bi diving bell by Jean-Dominique Bobby. There was a movie also, very beautiful. And uh, so sooner or later, they, they are able to use this channel to let you know. But also, unfortunately, there is a total, complete lock syndrome state. What do you do here? Very difficult. Um, so you're buried into your skull, actually into your brain. On the other hand, you know, so motor output, they're not necessary for consciousness, so you can be conscious and fully paralyzed, but you can also be disconnected <laughs> from the environment, from, from the sensory perspective, and still be aware. Say, this patient has a left hemispheric lesion, he would be completely aphasic, unable to understand commands. You can ask him to do anything you want, you won't understand. He's there, he's conscious, maybe he's in pain, maybe he wants to say something. He cannot speak, he cannot understand. So that's another case, another problem. And in general, you can have lesions to the nerves taking information from the outside to the center of the brain, so you can be disconnected. And you can be conscious and disconnected, both on the input and the output side. And you know, why do we know this? Above and beyond these dramatic cases of lesion, because we all dream every night. And when you dream, what happens is that you're fully conscious, vividly conscious, very intense, joyful, painful, scared. You're scared, you're scared sometimes, sometimes you're in a state of bliss, but you're fully disconnected. There is no, this state, this conscious universe that you experience when you dream, and it's strong consciousness, it is there irrespectively of input and output. There's no need for electrical impulses to uh, flow into the brain or flow out of the brain. And indeed, we are disconnected by physiological mechanism on the input side and also on the output side because spinal motor neurons are inhibited during dreaming. So consciousness exists without input and output and we keep measuring it based on input and output although we know very well from a first person perspective that it can exist regardless. This is the problem and this is more serious now because we have these brain islands who are possibly disconnected from the outside world. And we don't know what it feels like. So we are producing these brain islands and then we don't have ways to assess them in terms of experience, the most precious things, thing that exists. So that's why, you know, there is an ethical need also, a moral obligation to uh, discard the position, the skeptical position, say we'll never know, I mean, give up, stop here. No, we need to know. We need to find ways of measuring consciousness in the brain. Something, I mean, at least a capacity, a general capacity. When a physical system, when should I infer that the physical system is conscious and when not? I need, we need to do better here. So this is the challenge. And that's, that, that, is, that needs to be done independently of sensory input and motor outputs, of course. It's something, you know, it's a measure of the brain, of a physical system, properties of a physical system. It is not easy. Uh, I'll give you an example. I mean, this is, a, you know, it's, it's almost a joke, but the first person who tried to measure consciousness is this person. He's a was doctor from uh, Massachusetts, Duncan McDougall. And he, um, you know, this is a New York Times uh, 1907 uh, article. He also had a scientific article. And he wanted to measure um, what happens upon dying, when you die, uh, assuming that in that very crucial moment, something changes. And that's the weight of the soul. So what he did, he put people, terminal illness, people, tuberculosis, on a scale, on a very sensitive scale for the time, uh, when they're about, oh, they were about to die, and they died on the scale. And what he observed was that at that very moment, 21 grams were lost. You know the story, I mean, uh, at least you know the number. And, uh, and that was the weight of consciousness, the soul flying away at that very moment. So that was the first measure of something, like the soul or consciousness. Uh, well, of course, this was all wrong. I mean, methodologically flawed, completely wrong. Also, he had a control experiment where dogs were put on a scale, were dying, and the dogs were not losing weight. And actually, since dogs were assumed to have no soul, uh, that was the proof that uh, that was the weight of the soul. But dogs just don't sweat. So they don't lose, uh, you know, they don't have this final sweating and loss of, um, you know, water uh, upon dying, as a later physiologist demonstrated afterwards. So this is an extreme, 
you know, brutal example is, uh, of course, just more like a rhetorical point to, to say it is difficult anyways. Today we have incredible machines. Uh, we can measure anything, uh, you know, in the brain, but still it is easy to blunder and to make mistakes. Um, matter of fact, we, we still don't have a good measure. Take, you know, here I could go on for uh, 40 minutes saying, you know, what we can measure and why it doesn't really work. Two, only two examples here instead. So this is a brain, and it's a brain scan. So when you see red, activity is increasing. When you see blue, activity is decreasing. At time zero, you have a seizure with loss of consciousness. Brain activity explodes. Now you recover consciousness. The patient recovers consciousness, and activity goes down. So normally, you would say, well, Maybe consciousness depends on neural activity, makes sense. And maybe the more neural activity I have in the brain, the more conscious I am. So a silent brain is unconscious. A brain that is very active is very conscious. A brain that is active so and so here and there, it's conscious, you know, it's conscious in the middle, like this. But actually, it makes sense. I mean, in a way, you know, conscious might depend on neural activity, but it's not straightforward. So in some, on average, there is a correlation between level of neuron activity and consciousness. Even because, you know, when neurons are dead, they don't fire and they are not active. Fine. But if you look at cases like, many cases like seizure, for instance, you see that there's exactly the opposite pattern. So it's not a general way of measuring consciousness. You will never be able to build a consciousness meter based on uh, brain activity alone, whether you measure it with fMRI, PET, you, you name it. Um, Another example is, uh, well, anesthesiologist. Uh, they've tried a lot because of the problem I was saying before, anesthesia awareness. They wanted to find objective measures. They took an empirical approach. And actually, they built up on the basic notion that goes back to the beginning of the 20th century, 1928, when uh, Hans Berger uh, made the first electroencephalographic recordings, so brain activity from humans. And he observed already in his uh, subjects that you know, when you become drowsy and you start losing consciousness, rhythms are becoming, e.g., electrical waves are becoming uh, larger and slower. So you have, when you're awake, activated, you have fast waves that are small, and then you, when you start, you know, going down and dozing off, you have these waves until you are, you are fully asleep and you have these big, slow waves. So, I mean, textbook knowledge, notion is that, you know, there is, if you look at the e.g., electrical activity of the brain, if you see fast waves that are small, you're likely to be conscious. If you see slow waves that are large, you're likely to be unconscious. We all agree on this, I mean, in general, textbook, medical school, anywhere. But actually, so anesthesiologists, they, you know, took this and they put it, you know, quantified, you know, the shape of the wave, uh, the complexity of these waves, and, uh, you know, the frequency, uh, how big they are, this and that, and they come up with an index an empirical index. So basically, you, put one, you take 100 subjects awake, you anesthetize them, you feed the signal to a computer, and the computer extracts the features that best di differentiate between, between patient, patients who are awake and patients that are unconscious. And then you apply this to your patient, so you know that if, if, you, if, you, if you see an EEG pattern that is becoming you know, small and fast, uh, he's conscious. But actually, this index, called bispectral index, it's a little machine, just to give you an example, doesn't work. It doesn't work because it is not so simple, and there are many exceptions to the rule. So take this. If I am, I know what, what, what this slide is about, but if I am asked to say who's conscious, I say, no doubt, this is conscious, this is unconscious. I don't, I have no question. I mean, it's, uh, any medical student would say that. But actually, this is alpha coma. So this is a patient that after post-anoxic injury, as this kind of trace, and this is a status epilepticus in a boy, nine years old, who's fully conscious, but the waves are doing like this. Maybe just one part of the brain is doing like this, but what you see at the scalp when you record, it's big, slow waves. So there's no way you can tell based on these simple metrics. Again, they work on average, they work in general, but they don't work across different conditions at single subject level. You cannot trust them. They have no high accuracy, not enough. And this is, in a way, surprising, because despite all this effort, we still lack a reliable index. In the face of the technology we have today, we can almost read minds. You read papers and newspapers, sometimes, you know, 
you, you read, uh, you know, the brain area or the pattern of brain activity that distinguishes whether you're truly in love or you're faking being in love, or you, whether you are, um, you know, lying or being truthful, or you prefer, you know, the Democrats or the Republicans. But actually then, how come we can do all this subtle psychological distinction that we cannot, you know, say whether something, somebody is in there, whether there is a subject, which is the, probably the greatest ontological difference, that ex, you know, the, the biggest change, psychological change. And this is even more surprising because in the light of the fact that, uh, you know, uh, that there are projects like the Human Brain Project and the Blue Brain Project even before, where, uh, you know, beautiful things are happening, like we are taking whatever it's known about the brain from the molecular level at different scales to the system, and we're trying to replicate um, this into a computer simulation. Basically, we are rebuilding uh, what we know in biophysically realistic uh, models. There should be some sound coming out here, but uh, it's not coming out. It was working before. Maybe you fix it. I, I'm, I'm. So you see, this is a little bit, you know, this is, these are neurons firing. You would hear also ta -ta 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 -ta, like this. So these neurons are firing because all the rules are implemented there. Now, these are only, you know, a bunch of neurons. Uh, now they can simulate tens of thousands of neurons. And soon, the project is very ambitious, a mouse brain. And then maybe all the 100 billion uh, neurons of a human simulated, perfect simulation. Fast forward 30 years, and then assume that we have this. And then imagine that, let's see if it works. No. Imagine that we, um, that you are proposed a strange, uh, like a contract, and they say, okay, well, the, have you heard about uploading your brain on a computer? So it's, it's becoming pretty, you know, famous as a, as a notion that, you know, they propose you, okay, now just before you die, you know, you have a bad diagnosis, uh, you'll be anesthetized, they slice your brain, take pictures, everything, whatever, and then reconstruct and replicate your brain on a computer simulation. You will live forever. Actually, your neuron activ your neuronal activity will live forever and be simulated forever. Would you trust that? Would you give up one week of real, real, of biological life for this um, digital immortality? It's, a, it's an open question. We could do a survey. But the point is, I, for instance, would say no right now. I wouldn't accept that. Not because of moral, ethical. I mean, we can discuss about this. I mean, uh, but actually, I wouldn't trust it anyways. Because copying is one thing. Understanding is another thing. And if I'm not sure that things have been understood, with a law, with a general mechanism. I cannot trust it. Who tells me that they are actually copying the neurons that are relevant the, the right way, or that consciousness is not in some you know, biological wet secret that it cannot be simulated, or that it's a scale that cannot be taken in account in a digital simulation? I mean, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't trust them, simply because, and I give you two examples why I don't trust them, because of two things. In spite of all the things we know about the brain, we cannot answer two questions that are key. So, brain activity, yes, you can simulate my brain activity. All the spikes of my brain, billions of spikes per hour or whatever that is. But you have to explain first why when you fall asleep into deep non-REM sleep, consciousness fades completely, you cease to exist, you don't exist anymore, and neurons are still active. Look here, this is firing of cortical neurons during sleep. The brain does not shut down. It's actually pretty active, sometimes more active than wakefulness. Why is that? I don't trust you. You can replicate my brain activity, but if you don't explain that, I won't trust you. Second, which is even more, I think, extreme, is take what's in our head and you know, divide it in the thalamocortical system, which is the cortex, and the thalamus, which is a deep structure, pretty much around here, and then take the cerebellum. You'd be surprised, unless you know that, that the cerebellum, which is smaller in volume 
has ma many more neurons than the cerebral cortex. It's very big in numbers. Uh, actually, 80%, maybe 67% of the um, neurons in the skull are in the cerebellum. Hmm? So most of your neurons are in the cerebellum. It's just packed. It's a very elegant, compact structure. Uh, but the striking thing is that if you have a lesion to the thalamocortical system, you may lose con consciousness, coma, vegetative state. You can instead remove the cerebellum altogether. This is done by neurosurgeons. You can take 80 billions of neurons away out of 100 billion. So 80% of the neurons, you remove them, you trash them in the surgical you know, the waste bin, and consciousness is still there. The patient walks away vividly conscious, maybe a little bit, you know, uh, it's not the same way, he walks away in a different way, maybe like drunk, but fully conscious, completely conscious. So why is that? This lady in China, she realized she didn't have the cerebe cerebellum when she was 27. She was fully conscious, she was married, she had her job. Um, so you don't need it. So it's, you know, and the cerebellum is smart, super intelligent. Most of the smart thing we do is due to the cerebellum, but it's completely unconscious. Why is that? It has uh, excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, uh, neurotransmitter, all the cocktails of chemicals. It's a very nice, sophisticated, complicated structure. Why is it not contributing to consciousness? And what if the scientists are copying the cerebellum instead of the cerebral cortex or something? They don't get the difference between the two and the ingredients that is specific for the cortex is not there in the simulation. I don't trust them. And actually, these are the questions that you need to answer first. I mean, before getting into philosophical issues or to, uh, before going to measure things at the beds of the patient, we should solve these issues and we should, should have a hint of an explanation to these basic facts. These are the homework that we need to do first. So, uh, this might justify skepticism. On the other hand, so one could say, no, well, we should give up. Actually, we are not able to solve the problem. Or one could take a different perspective. This is Francis Crick, and his idea actually was, uh, well, maybe it is not a new experiment that we need, the new measurements, new data. It's just a law, a general law, some sort of uh, theoretical principle. Like with, before uh, you know, Darwin theories, we knew we had a lot of data. Uh, breeding uh, animals, everything, as if everything was known already, but there was a law missing, there was a, some general principle missing. Maybe we should find a general principle also with respect to conscience. Puts ev put everything together and then, you know, draw, uh, you know, device measures and make new predictions. We, we are lacking a law, not another experiment. So, uh, and this is the kind of approach they want to describe from now on, and actually, uh, yes, it's a theory. And it's this theory that is called information integration theory of conscience. It's one of the theories, not the only theory. Maybe it's not the right one. It might be wrong, but it's the one we've been testing and trying to falsify. It's called um, IITC, and it's actually, yes, um, it's been um, developed and uh, uh, actually put forward by Giulio Tononi, who uh, was uh, not raised and born, but actually who studied here in Pisa. Um, I think it's a beautiful theory. And I'll try to give a gist of the theory and the implication for measuring, the practical implication and some of the uh, you know, other more you know, general implications. So the main, um, say, uh, postulate of the theory is that the physical system is conscious to the extent that it integrates information, which sounds cryptical. It sounds uh, really, I mean, like the, like the usual, usual sentence about things about conscience. Well, OK, it's been interesting so far. Now it's, it gets crazy as usual, and uh, you know, we, we will get lost soon. Actually, I don't think so, and this is the challenge I want to take. It's a theory that starts from a very basic thing. It's from the only thing we know about consciousness. This theory starts from experience itself, from phenomenology. Nothing weird. It's just what are the basic properties of experience, how experience, the only thing we know cogito ergo sum, we can doubt about everything. Everything can be a postulate. The word might not exist. What I know for certain is I'm here, and that my being here has a certain structure, as I know it, as I can explore it right now. And the basic properties of this structure of experience are two. 
according to the theory. I'm simplifying a little bit. Highly informative, highly integrated. And uh, they are so, you know, um, bound to our experience that we don't even notice them because they, it's the day-to-day, second-by-second flow of experience. It's like this, so we don't pay attention. So two little experiments in order to, you know, explain what is information and what is integration in our consciousness and for the theory. First experiment, we are sitting in a room like this, uh, actually just, you know, you're alone uh, with a photodiode on your side like a simple resistance that is sensitive to light. Photodiode is able to signal the presence of light and darkness. You can do the same. So they tell you, okay, from now on, we will turn off and on the light in the room and you'll say whether there is light and dark. A very simple task. And the uh, experiment starts, it's light, dark, light, dark, and it goes on for 20 minutes, 40 minutes until you're completely fed up. And at the end of the experiment, uh, the performance is going to be good for you and the photodiode. Actually, a little bit better for the photodiode because you missed a couple of things, you were distracted, bored, and so on. So, no difference. An alien, external observer, comes in, knows nothing about bio biology, about the world. You can say, okay, same behavior, same input-output function. They're both quite intelligent. They can distinguish light and dark. I'm, for me, they're sort of equivalent. Um, now the room becomes red, all of a sudden. You say, oh, what's wrong? Red. Then half red, half blue. Then something familiar to me, maybe less to you than something else, than uh, animals that I know, uh, animals that I, I've never seen actually, but they exist in the depth of the sea, and then some animals that don't even exist, and you can have all possible combination of animals in all possible positions, in all possible environments. And now all the people of the world, the, the ones that lived in the past, the one who will live in the future, different in, dressed in different ways, billions of billions of billions of people, faces, speaking different languages, saying different things, and then all the paintings, uh, and then uh, all the frames of the movies that have been produced, and uh, including Bollywood, uh, billions of billions of billions of frames. I could go on forever, for 10,000 lives, and for each of these, you would enter a different state, right? And your brain would enter a different state. Every fraction of a second I, see, I show something. You enter a different state. Now, what about the photodiode? This is a key difference. But you don't know if you're an alien and look at the light-dark experiment. When the photodiode is ruling out light and saying dark, when, when he says dark, he only ruled out light. One thing, one other alternative state. When you say dark, that fraction of a second, even if it's dark, dark is the simplest thing, we tend to associate dark to no information. There is nothing there. Actually, dark rules out countless alternative possibilities. And this is pure information. Information is the longer, longer of the alternative possibility. The, lar the more possibility, the alternative possibility, the, the higher the information. When you toss a coin, it's one bit. When you throw dice, it's 2.6, more or less. When you, uh, and what about the brain? The brain is not a coin, it's not a dice, it's diamond. It's a diamond with billions of billions of billions of faces. So there must be a richness of internal mechanisms so that the brain, in a fraction of a second, 200 milliseconds, can enter one specific state, very different from any other countless state, very specific, out of billions of billions of, billions of other states. And this is, different, this is information which means physical differentiations in the system, much more than a, photo, than a photodiode. Okay, this is information. Now, the experiment becomes a little bit complicated. Instead of the photodiode, you have a camera, the sensor of a camera, which is one million photodiodes, an array. And now you do the same experiment. It's going to be light, dark, red, blue, red, whatever people, faces you, wherever you turn the camera, wherever you point the camera, you're going to have a different state in the sensor, just like your brain. So no difference at this point. You have no moral position with respect to a photodiode. You don't even have a moral position with respect to a camera, right? You don't think that the camera is conscious. Maybe it's, yeah, it's 200 euros rather than uh, 3 euros, but it doesn't really matter, I mean, in terms of conscience. But why is that? There must be a reason. 
Why is that? Why is the sensor of the camera unconscious of what, what's being displayed there? Why are we conscious? After all, the, the visual cortex it looks like a sensor of a camera. It's made of uh, little neurons uh, which are becoming active or non-active. What, what, what's the difference? Why is that? There must be an explanation for this. Now, the explanation is crucial and it's a little revolution, although it's very simple. We consider the camera one object, right? It's one thing. It has a price, it has a name, we can hold it in our hand. Now, take a thin blade and split the sensor in two. Does the function of the camera change? Is it changing? Imagine that we're not moving them apart, we're just, you know, just cutting the sensor. No, nothing changes because it was never one. Informationally speaking, causally speaking, there's no relation between the, there are parallel channels that, that, that design not to be one. And if you split in four, and if you split in 32, 64, you, and you go on until you split all the single photo that nothing changes. Actually, the camera was never one, the camera sensor. It was made of many elements of one bit, not one system with thousands of billions of thousands of billions of bits. Many little elements of one bit each, so there is no integrated information. This is an ontological error. It's an error of perspective that we do often. So you will correct me if I'm wrong, but there is no good measure of unity, of when one thing is one entity, rather than an aggregate of entities. And this is crucial for conscious and for integrated information. But it's crucial in general, I think, because otherwise we are keen to attributing unity in a very generous, an unrealistic way. A galaxy is a unity. Um, a camera is a unity. Uh, a mountain is a unity. We give unity by because things are near, because things are synchronous, because things are, I don't know, they stick together because they have a name. But that's not, that's not ontologically correct. It doesn't exist. The camera does not exist. If you take Occam's razor, you don't need a camera. All you need is the single photodiode. This is a key thing. What about the brain? What if you split the brain in two parts? You know what happens? Split brain, very famous experiment, and it's not an experiment, it's a clinical, you know, it's a treatment to prevent epilepsy from going to one hemisphere to the other. What happens is that you have two consciousness from that moment on, two people in the same brain. So the left of the brain does not know what the subject in the right of the brain is doing. They're completely separated. So one patient becomes two patients. He has a decent life. They have a decent life because they go along very well together, like super twins. They don't disagree. You normally talk with the guy in the left of the brain, but the one in the right of the brain is able to do other things like drawing, recognizing objects, and so on and so forth. But it's two people. And what if you divide the brain in uh, four, 64, uh, 100 pieces, well, we know what happens, unfortunately, because it's the, this is diffuse actional injury, when you have uh, like a car accident and you have a deceleration from 100 kilometers per second, per, yeah, per, per hour to zero, in a fraction of a second, you have this acceleration and the brain has different densities between the gray matter and the white matter and they move and you cut all the connections. What happens? Consciousness is lost. So if you split the brain in two, it's two conscious. Maybe if you split it in four, it's four. But then there is a critical point where you split it and consciousness is completely lost. So it makes a difference. Because the brain is one. It's really one. Actually, the thalamocortical system is one. And uh, when, I, when it enters one of the trillions of trillions of state, it does so as one single piece. How do we know that? We know it from phenomenology. You will not ever be able to see consciously at the same time the vase and the two profiles, for instance. When the brain enters one state, it enters one state as a whole. You cannot have two states because it's one machine in that very moment. You cannot unless you split the brain, you divide it in two. So this is the thing. This is phenomenology. The postulate is that you need to measure this very un unlikely, improbable, difficult, balance between unity and diversity, between integration and information in a physical system. We call it, henceforth, complexity. It's very difficult, 
it's very difficult at a political level between uh, you know anarchy and uh, you know dictatorship uh, in a social domain between uh, globalization and the uh, ghettos and uh, it's also even more so difficult in physical system very difficult to build physical systems that hold together but they're not homogeneous the, you, the more you connect the elements the more they do the same the more homogeneous they become the less information you have the more you make them independent the more differentiated they are but then they split they don't interact anymore and they're not one ontologically speaking so it's very difficult it's a difficult balance also when you use a simple system it's difficult to build them with a the computer and uh, but it's useful as a concept take the cerebellum now we have a clue what do we do well first of all we say is the cerebellum like the camera maybe and you compare it to the cortex you open why the hemispheres, and you see that there is a connection, of course, between the two hemispheres, 200 million fibers, it's called the callosum. Then you open the cerebellum in two and you have a surprise. Oh, there's no connection. The two hemispheres are completely independent. We don't think about it. It's, it's not even written on the book, clearly. When you, textbook of neurophysiology, it's, it's not even an information, it's not even relevant, but it's actually key. They're not connected. Take the cortex and you go with the microscope and look at the anatomy and you see that there is a, an exquisite balance between difference and unity. So different areas with different inputs still connected with long range, short range fibers in complicated and complex ways. So diversity is preserved but also unity is there. You take the cerebellum, it's a bunch of small circuits. It's a bunch of minimal processors. And they are actually independent. They receive an input, they spit out an output, and that's it. So the cerebellum, again, it's another illusion. It's an error of perspective. There is a chapter on the book about the cerebellum. You can hold it in your hand. It has a name, but it's not one. I'm sorry, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It's not a system with uh, 100 billion neurons. Uh, it's not one. You, know, you don't need it. So this is, again, it's an ontological mistake. It just doesn't exist. There's no integration of information. There's just tiny circuits with a little, small bit. Thus, you can remove it, and that's why consciousness disappears. This is very interesting, by the way, because, maybe I'll come back on this later if I have time, um, deep learning networks are feed-forward networks, just like the cerebellum. Input, divergence, and output. It's very, it's very similar, with a lot of plasticity. Cerebellum does a lot of things. It lets you drive your car from here to Rome, uh, but it, it's a zombie, it's not conscious, because it doesn't exist. It doesn't integrate information. Now, let's go back to this, and the challenge is actually to find measures to apply to patients, right? Above and beyond anatomy, we need to look at brain activity and infer on this kind of complexity based on you know, some kind of measure. So what do we measure? So we are good at measuring integration in neurophysiology. How do we measure it? Uh, temporal correlation, synchrony. If things, if neurons are active together, we assume they are one. They are part of the same system. Okay. Side effect is that if they go together, they do the same thing, there is no information. And actually, these measures of synchrony are good for synchrony, integration, but they're not sensitive to information. You measure one, you're missing the other part. Measures of differentiation is like entropy, for instance. Entropy is a measure of information, how different, unpredictable a pattern is. Yes, that's good, but it doesn't tell you whether this variability, unpredictability, is generated by one system or by a collection of many. If you take the electro spontaneous electrical activity from the brain, as uh, anesthesiologists do, uh, and you compute the entropy of the signal, you might see a you know, large entropy. But who tells you that this large entropy is produced by uh, one system or just many independent random uh, elements? Actually, entropy would be maximal for independent random element. So we have measures for synchrony, integration, we have measures for entropy, differentiation, but when you try to capture one, you miss the, the, the other one. When you try to capture entropy, you miss the unity. So, it's not easy. It's not easy to build this kind of complexity. It's not easy to measure. Now, so you know, with this in mind, we took a different approach and we said, okay, it's not enough to observe the physical system. You need to perturb it. 
And the reason is that the approach would be to perturb the system and measure the response of the system. And the rationale is quite simple, because if you do see so in a system that is causally independent, take the camera or the cerebellum, you would have a local response, because there's no global interaction. It's not one. And you know it by a causal perspective, not correlational. So you have this kind of response, you say. Some elements respond and the rest remain silent. If you do this in a system that is on the other end of the spectrum, that is fully integrated but homogeneous, you will have a large, big response, but very simple, stereotypical, all or none, this kind of thing. Only if the system strikes a balance between unity and diversity, then you're going to have something that is global, but difficult to describe, complicated. Because different elements are reacting with different properties at different times, and they all interact. And this is all by a causal perspective. And actually, our effort was to perform this kind of measure of complexity, of this balance between unity and diversity, by a causal perspective, independently of input and output, directly in the brain. So that's what we needed to do. This is very difficult from the other corals of consciousness that have been devised so far. It's more like, you know, actually, it's directly inspired to the theory, by, by the theory. It's the amount of information generated through causal interactions within one system that is integrated. Now, in practice, so we try to measure this kind of complexity. It's like measuring, you know, the music of an orchestra. You start an instrument, if they play together with different, uh, you know, lines and different, Mm, you know, sort of partitions, then you have this complex music. We, had, we try to do the same in the brain, metaphorically speaking. How do we do this? In a very coarse manner for the moment. That is, by perturbing directly the cortex, which is relevant for, for consciousness, so we bypass sensory input, motor output that are not necessary, with transcranial magne magnetic stimulation, and then we measure the music, the echo, produced by the system to this perturbation with electroencephalography. So this is the kind of system we decided to use to approximate this theoretical measure of complexity. Now I am, I'm asking Tonino a question. I think I'm running a little bit late, but not too much. Not, not, so do I have room to, to go for a... Are you okay if I go on like another... 15 minutes, say, we started later than, uh, anyways. So this is the machine. So the machine is basically stimulating the brain, recording from the brain, and you basically, you're knocking on the brain directly, on the thalamocortical system directly, and you get the overall electrical response of the system. It's pretty close to what we were, you know, uh, looking for in those simplified models. What happens in wakefulness? Wakefulness. You expect to have unity and diversity. What you see when you perturb locally the cortex is that actually you have unity because you have a local perturbation, but many areas are reacting. You see many traces, electrical traces, produced by different areas of the brain. And also, each area is re reacting in a specific differentiated way. It has its own signature. So, intuitively, there's this balance between integration and information or differentiation. And if you look at the, you know, spatial temporal dynamics, you hit the brain, then you have milliseconds there running, and you see that there is this complex pattern of causal interaction that is global, unity, but also dif dif diverse, difficult to describe information. And it lasts for about 300 milliseconds. It's a long time for the brain. Um, okay, so this is what we see in uh, conscious wakefulness. Now the subject goes to sleep. Same brain, same everything, we're stimulating exactly the same spot. What you see is quite surprising. So the brain reacts, is active and reactive, actually, we knew that, but in a different way. It's this positive, negative, uh, big, you know, explosion. Uh, and if you look at how it propagates, it's a strong local activation, as if unity is lost, integration is lost. So it, it stays there. Center of mass of activity is localized there. This is already very interesting in theoretical terms because it's not activity, it's not synchrony, it's not a uh, number of neurons, it's the unity, the integration by a causal perspective. You perturb it and you don't have, you don't have a causal interaction. So it looks pretty much like this. If you, if you try to stimulate so this kind of situation, uh, 
uh, theoretically speaking. If you try to overcome, and maybe you say, well, maybe neurons are lazy when you sleep, you try to hit really hard the brain with a strong magnetic impulse, and you crank up the stimulator, the best result you get is this. It's a huge positive-negative wave, which is still very simple. It propagates like this, like an oil spot. It goes uh, just like tossing a stone in the water. It's a very simple, uniform pattern of activity, which speaks for a loss of differentiation. Yes, you, you force the system to act as one, but then you lose the complexity of the spread. So there is no way in between when consciousness is lost, which is, uh, you know, what's good in theoretical terms. Say, okay, let's go move forward. Let's see dreaming when you're disconnected from the external world. You're awake, you're here, you tell me, I trust you. Actually, I do the experiment on myself first, and I see complexity. Then I fall asleep, I wake up, I say, look, I, I wasn't there. As far as I know, I didn't exist in that moment. This is the kind of response you have. And then they wake me up and uh, I say, I was dreaming, actually. I was in the airport and this happened and, this, and I tell a story, a long story, 400 words maybe, and this is the kind of response you have. So you can see that there, is, there was a capacity for consciousness, you don't know what of, but that there was complexity and there was a capacity. And this correlates very well with the reports of the subjects, above and beyond what you're doing, input and output. Uh, we moved to anesthesia. I'm making a, a very long story short, 10 years in uh, one minute. Uh, anesthesia, we tried different anesthetics. Uh, wakefulness, I'm here, no problem, and high complexity. Prop midazolam anesthesia, subject is unconscious, you have this sleep-like, simple, stereotypical up and down. Propofol, same story. Xenon, another anesthetic. This is a gas anesthetic. It's completely different mech mechanism of action, but still the same thing. Everything converges into this low complexity response. It's either local or global and stereotypical. So it's either loss of integration or loss, or loss of information. Then one last anesthetic, very interesting, that is ketamine. Ketamine is a powerful anesthetic. It is um, also a drug of abuse, but it's been used as an anesthetic because it's very safe and because uh, it's very effective. You can have a, cat a subject anesthetized with ketamine, you can have surgery, like also serious surgery, and the subject won't complain because he's not there. But not because he's unconscious, he's somewhere else. He's having hallucination of all kinds. It's, he's in another world. It's an extreme case of dreaming. And the stories, you know, told by ketamine anesthetized subjects are really crazy. Sometimes are good, sometimes are bad trips, so that's why ketamine is not used a lot. So ketamine is an extreme case of disconnected consciousness. And the patient is eyes open, just like the vegetative state. He looks awake. Well, vegetative state with consciousness, though. So he looks awake. He's fully unresponsive to the point that he can have surgery without complaining, but he's conscious. And he tells you a story afterwards. The difference is that patient, they cannot tell the story. And this is the kind of you know, complexity we measure. So it's, as you see, it's a complex response. Although the EEG, spontaneous EEG is mixed, although completely, the subject is completely unresponsive. Thus, by knocking on the brain and measuring complexity, we can have a reliable index that is sensitive even to the extreme case of disconnected conscience. So this was good. So we took this to the, to, you know, we did many experiments, rejection of papers, you know the story, very difficult. Finally, we came up with a measure that we were sort of ready to apply to patient. And the measure captures what we saw and what we said so far in one number. It's a theory-driven measure. The idea is that if you have a system that is integrated and differentiated, you have this kind of response. We've seen them. How do you quantify that? You just zip. You try to compress. So you have an activation of the brain, you binarize the activation, one is active, zero is non-active, you have this matrix. So if you have a system that is not integrated, it's local, it's easy to compress. It's like an image, a picture, it's very easy to compress. If you have a system that is integrated but homogeneous, it lacks differentiation, you have a huge response, but it's redundant because they're all doing the same thing. Easy to zip, low complexity, that is high, compressi high compressibility, this is algorithmic complexity. Only if the system is one, but differentiated, you will have a big matrix, causal matrix of interaction, that is diverse. So it's difficult to compress. This is one number, it's a scalar. You can put it on one axis, and you can measure it in brains, and you can calibrate it 
Actually, the first thing we did is we calibrated the measure, we called it perturbation and complexity, on a bench benchmark of subjects who were telling us, I'm here, I'm awake, I was here, I was dreaming in ketamine, in, in sleep, and then subjects saying, I wasn't there, I didn't exist as far as I could tell. So it's a calibration based on the ground truth. You need that because you don't know where patients are. So first you need the calibration, you need the scala, you need the calibration, then you, you, know, you come up with a cutoff, and then you slice through the patients, you don't know where they are. You take unresponsive patients and you see, for instance, that there are two ways of being in an unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. That is, patients who are actually in a low complexity state, just like the subject who say, I, I didn't exist, and patients who are in a high complexity state. And these are not few, like they are 18, 20% of patients. And this is the kind of response we get only when consciousness is present and never when consciousness is absent in the benchmark. And we know that consciousness can be present but disconnected. So we need to pay attention to these patients. So these are, according to the calibration, the measurement, the theory and everything, patients who are actually conscious but disconnected. Conscious cortical islands. And we have to treat them as such. And actually, if you look at recovery in this patient, they are much more likely to recover. But they're not recovering consciousness. They're recovering the way, the input and the output to express that they were conscious, most likely. But this is a different story. So this is a very important you know, uh, part of the story with ethical implications. So you need to use brain-machine interface and do your best to implement communication. They don't have a problem with consciousness. They just are unable to express it and co to communicate with the outside world. This is a different story, although they are under the label of the vegetative state. This is, these are low complexity patients. And this is again very interesting. This would be another talk why some patients are stuck in a low complexity state even though their brain is uh, sort of structurally there in large part. Um, so, I just want to say one word about this. This is a patient in a vegetative state. You see cortical island, metabolically active, local response, uh, low complexity, and then for some reason, after a few weeks, he recovers. Structure being equal. There must be something by which complexity recovers. The way neurons are working is not the structure. It's the function, the way neurons. There are many nonlinear features in neurons. And maybe you go above threshold and complexity, which is a matter of criticality, comes back. We need to understand what happens here. This is a, a complicated story. We are addressing, of, of obviously, the mechanism of loss and recovery of complexity. And I tell you, it's very interesting. We are using intracranial, extracranial recordings in patients. In, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the, just to give you a, the, the flavor of it, complexity can collapse and recover because of details of how neurons are functioning. Too much inhibition critical level of opening of potassium channels, stupid things, and complexity collapses. And actually, when we fall asleep, complexity collapses. The thing is that it recovers, you know, when we wake up. We give it for granted, but, you know, it's a fact that it's a matter of threshold. So this is one part of the story. Implication number one, very practical. Detecting patients who are locked, completely locked in. This is the safety coffin of the Victorian age where people were afraid to be buried in, uh, you know, uh, and so they were renting these complicated coffins with signaling, bells, whistles, and things, and uh, nobody, they woke up actually in, in one of these devices as, as far as I know, but they were uh, sort of, you know, they were rented at the time. Now the risk is true because you can be, um, you can be a cortical island, a thalamocortical island, big thalamocortical island in your brain, and you need to find ways to let them, to let them you know, know that they exist. And then uh, the implication number two. You know the story, I'm almost done. AlphaGo, uh, this uh, deep uh, mind, uh, super deep learning um, algorithm that was able to beat people, champions, not at chess, that is easy, but at Go, the uh, thousand years old uh, Chinese uh, board game, very complex. Actually, they're almost, you know, uh, considered as, you know, super smart and inspired people, the champions. Well, they were beaten a couple of years ago, actually one and a half years ago, at Go. And uh, that's, that changes history in a way. This is the smartest, most difficult, creative 
board game and the computer is beating a human, it's been a revolution. It's been on newspapers and it, it matters, obviously. These are networks, fit forward, deep learning networks with many layers. Uh, they can also learn from their own mistakes. They can learn playing uh, within the network, one network against the other, and they improve and they beat people. And, you know, so this is not general artificial intelligence, but it's very intelligent, very intelligent artificial intelligence. And sooner or later, these algorithms are becoming more and more powerful. I was at a meeting in Toronto recently. Things are changing fast, very fast. It's crazy what's happening. So the question is that, you know, sooner or later, we'll have the patients on one side, and the, which are conscious but paralyzed, and the robotic uh, super performing uh, being a machine on the other side. And already I have troubles explaining my kids that Siri, iPhone Siri, who, is, who actually answers their questions, is not smarter or, say, more conscious than the little cousin who's five months old and does nothing. Except for, so they interact much more with Siri, with the, and I explain them because I think it's important for the future to have the sensitivity for conscience, for experience. It's very precious, it's very rare, and we need to value that in spite of intelligence, we, had to, we don't have to mix up intelligence and conscience, function and experience. I think that's going to be a problem. And again, I'm borrowing a, a slide from uh, Tononi and Koch. And, you know, in principle, you know, you could have brains and machines that are functionally equivalent. They do the same things. Actually, a machine could be better than us at some point. But that doesn't matter. You have to look at how things are done because you can do the same input-output, and this is demonstrable with the with a given structure that is integrated. It's difficult, but it's an integrated structure, and you can replicate the same input-output, the same behavior, by unwrapping the structure into a number, a huge number of elements in a feed-forward system. Difference is this is integrated, this is not. This exists intrinsically as one thing. This does not exist as one thing. It's a fit-forward thing with no internal interaction, no integration. Everything is determined by the output, and the next layer, and the next layer, and so on. So it's completely different. It's ontologically different. Theoretically speaking, if the theory is right, this is uh, conscious, this is unconscious, but they behave the same, and it's going to be crucial for the future. And consciousness exists, and it exists even without interaction, function, and, uh, you know, anything. I swear, two slides, beautiful ones, I promise. <laughs> you won't regret. So, uh, number three is the existential thing. So, why is, what's special about this object? So, we don't know yet, actually. Uh, theory might be right or wrong, but I think that this thing of unity is crucial. Think about it. Um, consider the cerebellum. The cerebellum doesn't exist. Consider a camera, the camera doesn't exist. The camera is very small, the brain is huge, uh, breaks down in small pieces. Consider von Neumann computers, they break down in small mechanisms. Uh, consider the internet, also it breaks down. Uh, cerebellum, the, the brain is still there, everything crumbles. And uh, look at this, now you know, now I'm, I'm almost, it's almost blasphemy to show this here but I'm taking a risk. So you look at the grandest, most giant things that exist, galaxies and uh, you know, uh, stars and uh, nebulae and so on. So for the theory, if you look them, to them through the lenses of integration information, these are, they break apart. They're not one, they, like, it's dust, okay? The grandest things. And then you look at the brain, and I hope you fix the music right now. Did, did, do we have? Uh, this is really bad. Well, this is, I cannot sing it. It's a, it's a beautiful music. Go to the website of Stephen Smith and Catherine Smith and look at this. This is a journey into the cerebral cortex from the, ah, from the bottom to the top. To the um, top oh, with a wonderful, wonderful soundtrack, which was actually um, written, written by them. Now. Uh, what do we see here? It's trivial, but it's not so trivial if you think about what we've been seeing so far. The, the red dots are synapses, connections. 
and there's plenty, plenty of connections. There's an insane number of connections. Each neuron receives 10,000 connections. And, uh, and you can go down into the brain and you see connections, 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 connections. And then you see, you know, neurons here and there. Of course, there are neurons. You know, uh, if you go here, you see neurons. But there are a lot of connections. It's a completely different object. What is the difference of this object I'm holding in your brain, in, in my hand? It's one object. Do you have a question? No. I am uh, I'm in the hurry right now, so may I ask one question? Sure. Right yes. What do you think about the what do you think about the possibility that brain may be a quantum computer? I know there have been recent developments in this area. The brain project. Uh, yes, so, yes, I, I'll, I'll finish, if, I'll, I'll come back to this one. But let, yeah, because I mean, I, it's, it's, a, it's a big question. Let me finish here. I mean, normally this is the poetic part of my talk. It's completely screwed up, but, you know, try to, <laughs> there's no music, there's no, <laughs> anyways, the thing is, look at this object, it's one. It is one, it's trivial, it, des it is designed to be one thing. It is not trivial if you think about the other objects, they're not. So what, are, what is the consequence, the almost, I would say ontological, philosophical, or even simple-minded conclusion? It's the largest thing that exists, put simply. Maybe at some point we will be able to measure that, above and beyond patient and everything, that that's the largest ob object in terms of diversity in a unity, in terms of existence, intrinsic existence. All the rest exists intrinsically or minimally, because they're very small. And the thalamocortical system, it's huge. Not only of humans, maybe. And this is what actually Emily Dickinson, and she's the real poet, said already. This is a very popular, uh, you know, among neuroscientists, this poem. I don't know if you can read it, but you probably know it. It says, and these are the only last words I say, il cervello è più esteso del cielo perché metti di fianco a fianco l'uno l'altro conterrà con facilità e te in aggiunta. Il cervello è più profondo del mare perché tieni di azzurro contro azzurro l'uno l'altro assorbirà come le spugne e secchi assorbono. Il cervello ha giusto il peso di Dio perché soppesali libra per libra ed essi differiranno, se differiranno, come la sillaba dal suono. Se un giorno arriveremo a dimostrare questo, non lo sappiamo, però mi sembra una prospettiva interessante che ha delle ricadute pratiche e che ha, secondo me, anche un sapore esistenziale, tutto sommato, eh, positivo, cioè non è riduzionista oltretutto. Vi ringrazio. So thank you very much. It has been really a pity to, to uh, we would have uh, stayed on and listening to you, but uh, for the sake of getting questions, I had to stand up and be, and be the naughty guy. <laughs> so I'm sure there are lots of questions. Chi comincia? The, the one I already asked about the possibility of brain being a quantum computer. So could this complexity be due to entanglement, uh, for instance? It's, a, it's, a, it's of course a very interesting, interesting question. You know, what, what people say, but this is just a joke, they say, okay, there's quantum physics, there's consciousness, and then you put them together, you have a minimization of mysteries. That's what they say. But actually, it's a serious uh, question. And I think that, um, you know, it all boils down to uh, what is the spatial temporal grain where uh, information integration is maximal. Because we didn't get, in, you know, I didn't go, of course, into the theory. Uh, I did it only, you know, very, in a very simple and simplified way. But, so it, ma it is maxima of integrated information that counts, and it is actually then maxima of cause-specific cause-effect interactions in the system. 
So what is the temporal and spatial scale where this is maximized? I give an example that is a little bit mm, peripheral to quantum physics, but if you take um, nanotube, microtubules, which have been implicated in quantum physics conscious by Stuart Hameroff, for instance, uh, he says that they are important because there is some quantum properties of this uh, neuronal structure, but do they actually have a causal, reliable causal role at the whole brain level, or are they effect, their effect and their cause effect power limited and local? So that is a question. It's still an open question, and, uh, and the, the measure and the, the theory is very open to any, I mean, it's actually, it's a theory that is more of physics than neuroscience. And uh, it actually first attempts, ideally, to measure where is the scale where you have maximum cause-effect power. Is that the, if that is the scale of, uh, you know, quantum entanglement or the, that domain, that, then it's fine. It's totally fine. In the brain, trivially speaking, I mean, is it the scale of microseconds or the scale of minutes or the scale of hundreds of milliseconds? Well, I would say it is not the scale of milliseconds because in a millisecond there's no time for causal interactions. I would say that it's not the time of seconds because by three seconds what the neuron has been, done, has been doing on another neuron is already sort of lost in the sea of uh, stochastic spontaneous activity. It's more likely the time of hundreds of milliseconds that, according to synaptic delays and uh, conduction times, is the time where you can actually have strong, stable, reliable interactions on the scale of the brain. And actually, maybe it's by chance, but the time scale of consciousness is a few hundred milliseconds. So phenomenology, you know, matches uh, the maximization, temporal maximization of information integration. On the spatial scale, um, I don't know, but it's something that would need to be evaluated, of course, the theory should develop measures and apply measures at different special temporal scales. So, thank you. Uh, uh, given the time that uh, if there is no burning question now, uh, we have a small refreshment now and Marcello will, will, will be. So, uh, all this, uh, everybody is, is welcome to, to approach uh, um, uh, the speaker and, and uh, directly ask the question. So I thank again very, very much for your talk and thank you to the audience for the talk.